Welcome back. It is still Wednesday, November 4th, 2015. This is still a morning edition, a special morning edition on I-24 News to commemorate the late Israeli Prime Minister Tzhak Rabin, who was assassinated 20 years ago today. Now, the bullets fired by Igal Amir on the night of the murder were targeting a prime minister, but they were also targeting the ideas he represented. While for some, Rabin's willingness to sit down with PLO chairman Yasser Arafat and try to wrench out an agreement that would produce peace between Israel and the Palestinian was the fruition of a dream, for many others, Rabin was a traitor to Israel and the Jewish people surrendering land to terrorists. The embodiment of Rabin's desire for a solution to the decades-long conflict was the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993, a set of agreements meant to lead down the path to a permanent peace. Let's first take a look at the next report by Mandy Kogosowski and Tal Shalev, who sat down with the Oslo Accords architects to hear what they have to say 20 years after the assassination. For the Israeli peace camp, the three bullets that ended Yitzhak Rabin's life did not only murder the Israeli prime minister, they killed the peace process as well. Rabin was known as the number one soldier who spent most of his life fighting the Arabs. But towards the end of his life, he became a soldier of peace, signing the historic Oslo Accords, marking the first time Israelis and Palestinians acknowledged each other's right to exist. Oslo wasn't Rabin's idea, it was the brainchild of his political foe, then Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, and more precisely, Peres advisors, primarily a group of Israeli academics and lawyers who initiated informal contacts with the PLO. Today, they are known as the Oslo architects. Mid-May 93, the then Foreign Minister Shimon Peres called me to his home and told me that uh, Prime Minister Rabin and he had made a decision to send uh, formal official for a talk with the PLO about a document of principles uh, that would lead to a peace process. We found out that we had a partner on the other side. Until then, we had never met these people, Abu Allah and others. Since the, the first uh, meeting with uh, them, uh, it was quite obvious, although I was not directly meeting with them, uh, that uh, there were people on the PLO side who wanted very much to have an agreement as uh, soon as possible. Rabin reached his second term as prime minister hungry for action after promising a peace agreement within nine months. Although he was dragged into the Oslo process, he decided to give it a go. More than a process, more than a lot of points along the road, Oslo is a decision. Oslo is a courageous decision by the late Prime Minister Rabin and by Shimon Peres, not only to put an end to a conflict of one century, which is very difficult, it's a decision to have a two-state solution. You have to understand Rabin thinking. It is essential for Israel to develop what we call the three-circle strategy. The three-circle strategy means that we have an understanding with the Palestinians, um, that because we have understanding with the Palestinians, we create very close relations with Egypt, with Jordan, with the neighboring countries. And this makes it possible for us to work closely together with the United States in order to defend ourselves against threats that come from Iran, Pakistan, and the third and the other circle. The agreement reached its public climax on September 13, 1993, at the White House. Rabin shook hands with Arafat, but there was no love there. It was a dramatic paradigm change. Arafat was a well-known terrorist and for years was a forbidden partner for dialogue. They hardly agreed on anything, but they had one thing in common, that this is a national conflict that needs a national solution. In other words, two states on the same land. So even if there are differences of narratives, you can create a future narrative that is positive. Rabin understood that we have, we are, we are the, the senior partners with the Palestinians. We have to develop a partnership of confidence, even if this is a difficult partner. The golden years of the Oslo era were short. While the leaders were marching toward an agreement, fear and terror flooded the streets. A wave of Palestinian terror attacks inflamed the Israeli public, significantly eroding support for the accord. 
On November 4th, 1995, Rabin was shot dead at the end of a rally in support of the Oslo Accords in a culmination of Israeli right-wing dissent over the agreement. The assassin, Igal Amir, stated clearly that he wanted to stop the process that was killing Jews. The enemies of peace is what brought terror from the Palestinian side, and the enemies of peace is what brought the assassination of Rabin. Then, on the 4th of November, 1995, the feeling was that, yes, he, he succeeded to kill the prime minister, but he could not kill the process. So the feeling then, after his assassination, was not that everything stopped, but the other way around, that it will continue, that it is, it is our role to continue it, and that there will be a very big support for the continuation of the process. Only now I can say that these three shots were the, the ones which stopped the process for decades. Oslo was supposed to be an interim phase of five years and was supposed to lead to a final status agreement that would establish a Palestinian state. Two decades after the assassination, no Palestinian state, thousands of people killed from both sides, and the peace process is gasping its last breath. The Oslo architects, however, still have hope. At the end of the day, if Israel wants to exist as Jewish and democratic, it will need a border. Two-state solution is a vested, essential, vital interest of Israel to maintain itself as the Jewish and democratic state that we shall be and that we are. Look, to make peace uh, is very difficult. It has been difficult in South Africa, in Ireland, in former Yugoslavia. But it succeeds over decades. This too will succeed. It will take a lot of time and a lot of suffering and a lot of mistakes. But we will get back to the, to the way of Oslo because we have no choice but to divide the land. Let's go straight live to Kikar Rabin, Rabin Square, where I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalevo did this fabulous report with Mandy Kargosowski is standing by. And the co with her is co-chief at the Camp David Summit and senior fellow at the INSS Gilad Shir. Well, yes, yeah, we were speaking of hope for peace. Well, against the, well, not against, there is a strong notion that uh, Rabin's assassination killed the peace process, but actually the peace process continued. It was stalled under uh, Rabin's predecessor, Benjamin Netanyahu, but when Ehud Barak came into power in 1999, negotiations with the Palestinians were renewed uh, in full power. And as you said, we're joined by uh, Gilad Cher, who was the chief negotiator at uh, Camp David. Gilad, at the end of the negotiations at Camp David, when they collapsed, the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak came back to Israel and he said um, there is no partner at this point for a peace agreement. So in your opinion, what was the, what was the case? Why don't we have a, a process today? Was it Rabin's assassination or was it the fact that there in, in, in fact there was no Palestinian partner? Well, there's a myriad reasons for that, but I believe that uh, Rabin's assassination was a major major derailment of, uh, of the process, which we resumed, as you uh, rightly pointed out, uh, when Barack was uh, elected to power. When we came back from Camp David, indeed, Barack said, there's no partner for the entire end of conflict core issue resol resolution uh, at this point in time. And the fact of the matter is that we continued to negotiate. We had about 40 daily sessions between Camp David and the outbreak of the Intifada. And then, a couple of months later, we had the Clinton parameters, which, up until uh, those very days, um, is a very valid plan for ending the conflict. But that sentence that Barack said that day, that, uh, that there's no Palestinian partner, basically, um, in the peace camp, many believe that that was disastrous for the peace camp, that had a disastrous effect on the Israeli will for peace, on the Israeli belief or trust in even reaching an agreement with the Palestinians. In hindsight, hindsight you're right. I, uh, I agree. However, uh, we continued to negotiate, and the negotiation uh, again resumed in the Annapolis process eight years later during uh, Almert's uh, premiership. I believe that uh, there's no other way for Israel's national security and for Israel's character and identity as the national homeland of uh, the Jewish people, a democratic one, a liberal one, based on universal values. There's no other way 
but to separate from the Palestinians into a two-state, for two people, um, reality with a, a border that, uh, that is delineated between, uh, between those two uh, national homes of um, respectively the Palestinian people and the Israeli people. Can this it is happen with the current leaderships in the Israeli and Palestinian society? Uh, well, I believe there's uh, hope for that to happen. Uh, I can't assess at this point in time that this is uh, very uh, probable in the, um, in the upcoming foreseeable future. Gilad Sher, thank you very much for joining us, Yael. So uh, we see uh, definitely that uh, the Rabin assassination has a disastrous effect basically on the will, but there were also other historical events that changed the course of history and had an impact on where we are standing today. Back to you, to the studio. Yeah.